Jesus is the answer. Jesus is sufficient no matter what is going on in our life. So the question I have is, do you believe he is the Christ? He is the Lord. We live in a world that does not understand him, a world actually that, that believes, some believe he, he didn't even live. No such thing as Jesus. You can watch some of the programming on TV, and it's supposedly documentaries searching and researching, did this man ever live? And there are those that question if he ever lived. My question to you is, do you believe he is who, you, who he said he was? And, and basically, the text we're going to look at is the response of people around him. I believe he is the misunderstood Jesus. Because when you walk with him through the gospel, you see the different reactions of people that don't understand. Now, let me just be careful to say, when you, when you believe in the Lord Jesus, it doesn't mean you have him all figured out. In fact, if you've got him all figured out, you are the judge, and you sit in judgment on him. Don't ever go there. We forever are on a journey and a passionate pursuit of knowing Jesus. Just like Paul, when he wrote the book of Philippians, it's near the end of his life, and yet he said, I want to know Jesus. I want to know Christ. You mean he didn't know him? No, he knew him, but there's still so much to know. You see, my belief today, I don't understand a lot of things about Jesus. Man, I've, I've been through this book. I've taught this book at a master's level. I, I've, I've spent years studying him and walking with him. I don't understand a lot of things about him, but one thing I know, Jesus Christ is Lord. There is no question in my mind. He is the Christ. He is the Lord. And so belief is not understanding everything, but understanding enough to know that he is who he said he was. So here's what's going to happen. His family thought he was crazy. The religious leaders thought he was demon-possessed. But at the end of the passage, Jesus said, but to those who are in obedience to my Father, to those who believe, you're my family. My desire and my prayer is for everyone in the sound of my voice and those that are watching, whether you're streaming or whether you're watching a broadcast, my prayer is that you will know him as Lord and you will be a part of the family of God. So here's a quote I want us to get in front of us because it sets up the passage. This is from John Phillips, who is an English scholar, and um, I I just think he captured the essence of it. It's going to be on the screen as I read it. The greatest sin a person can commit is not to believe in God's beloved son. That's the sin of sins, the ultimate sin, the damning sin. It's like a man who has a deadly but curable disease. He goes to the doctor who prescribes a remedy, but the man refuses to take it. He dies not because he had the disease, but because he spurned the remedy. All of us have the sin virus in our soul, but God has provided an infallible remedy in his son, a remedy that he offers on the simple basis of belief. Those who will not believe in the son go to a lost eternity, not because they are sinners, but because they have refused God's remedy. It all comes down to belief. Now, what's so cool about that statement is that nobody goes to hell because of their sin. I I hear all the time, there are sins that will send you to hell. No, there's only one sin that will cause a person to go to hell. What is that sin? Rejecting the remedy. Refusing the remedy. In other words, it's not our sin that sends us to hell, nor lack of sin that gets us to heaven. It all comes down to one thing. Believe in Jesus. God's remedy for mankind. One simple belief. One simple truth. Now watch what happens as we meet family. I have grown up in the church. And the dangerous thing about belief is it's not proximity. It has nothing to do with proximity. Some of you have grown up in the church but still are yet to believe. Oh, you know mentally And you understand intellectually that Jesus, you know, lived and did this and did that. But that's not belief. Belief in the New Testament is not a noun. It's a verb. So if I have this medicine bottle 
And we all have a disease. But I know for a fact that taking one of these will cure you. I would stand here every day as long as it took to give this to you. And to offer it to as many as possible. Now, if you come every Sunday, you're near the medicine. But that's not the same. I can sleep with this under my head tonight, but it's not the same. I can read about the medicine. I can even look at the bottle. I mean, I can, I can know all this stuff about the medicine, but it never is effective until I what? Until I take it. So belief in the New Testament is this. It's taking it. It's an M&M in case you were wondering. <laughs> it's a peanut M&M. I've been trying to figure out a way I could eat an M&M in the service, and I finally got it. It's, <laughs> do you have something to drink? I got some water. <laughs> I'll be spitting peanuts down on our friends here, and I don't want to do that. So it's, it's to take it. So belief is not just being near it. I grew up in the church, but there was a moment where I put my belief, and I said, Jesus, you are Lord. I didn't understand everything about him. How much can you know at nine years of age? I knew enough that I believed he was who he said he was. The ones closest to Jesus on this earth, when he walked on the earth, his family thought he was crazy. They thought he was crazy. Go to the text. Chapter 3. Look at verse 20. Then he went home. And the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying he's out of his mind. The closest ones to him, they could not understand him. Now, by the way, he's in Capernaum. He's at home. That's most likely Simon Peter's house. Capernaum is on the Sea of Galilee. Where did Jesus' family come from? They were not from Capernaum. You remember where he grew up? Where did Jesus grow up? Nazareth. Nazareth is a long way away. I mean, it's a bus ride, an hour bus ride. They walked, and they showed up. Why? To seize him. The word is seize. It's not a good word. It doesn't mean they walked and said, hey, Jesus, won't you come home with us? Or, hey, Jesus, why don't we go over here? No, no, no. The word is arrest. It's basically for, for those that live in Florida, Baker act him. It's an intervention. It literally, it is, it is to come against his will. That's the same word that, that Mark uses when he talks about John the Baptist being arrested by Herod. They came to seize him. Why would they do that? Because they thought he was out of his mind. That is the word for crazy. It's the word for being insane. How in the world did they miss that? How do we miss it? You know, there are people that tell us we're crazy for following Jesus. You realize that, huh? There are people in this world that look at you today and think about what you could be doing. You could be at the beach today. You could be at one of the parks today. You could be playing golf today. I mean, they think we're crazy for showing up on Sunday. They think we're crazy for following a man we've never seen. They think we're crazy for believing a book that's ancient. They think we're crazy for giving money to a cause called the church that so many have questioned. Think about it. Have you ever had friends tell you you were crazy because you were a follower of Jesus? Have you ever had somebody around you? The minics that we honored a minute ago, missionaries get it all the time because people think they're crazy for leaving this country to go live somewhere. Why? For this Jesus. Well, let me tell you something. At nine years of age, I said, Jesus, I believe you are the Lord. I'm 60 years old. And I'm still crazy after all these years. I will follow him anywhere. I will be crazy if that's what you call a follower of Christ. But it does not deter me. It did not deter him. Jesus came for a mission, and that mission was to save me, and I will follow him. Nobody's ever loved me like Jesus. So here's his family. They don't get it. Their unbelief was that he was crazy. Now we move to the religious leaders. They're even worse. They thought he was demon-possessed. Go to the text with me, verse 22. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he cast out demons. 
So they actually thought Jesus was exercising and casting demons out by the power of Satan. Now, Beelzebul is a name for Satan. It's actually a Philistine god from the Old Testament that became, the name became associated with Satan. So it's just another name for the devil or Satan. Where I came from, it was Beelzebubba, but it's still the same. So no matter where you came from, it's Satan. So here they are. They're saying you're casting out demons by the power of Satan. Well, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, that, it doesn't make any sense at all. But you know why they believe that? The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes would often assign to the devil what they didn't understand. They would call it of the devil if they didn't understand it and, and if they'd never experienced it. Before we're quick to judge them, we, w- we need to be very careful at rejecting a work of God and assigning it to something else. Because I know a lot of Christians, they hear about a movement at a church or a denomination, or they hear about believers somewhere and God doing something, and there's, this, there's the tendency, if you don't understand something, well, that can't be of God. That's, that's got to be something else. I'd be real careful. Because what, he, <clears throat> what he's about to talk about is the unforgivable sin. So that context is important because I want you to know what was going on when he said that. And it basically was they didn't believe he was truly from God. They even thought he was possessed. So here's what Jesus does. He teaches two parables and then gives a warning. And the warning is what puts chills down your spine. The two parables are real simple. The first one, read with me, it's in verse 23. And he called them to him. And he said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he can't stand, but is coming to an end. So in other words, the first parable was a simple parable about how crazy it was to believe he was doing it by the power of Satan. It doesn't make sense. It would be Satan casting out Satan. That means that Satan is divided and that he's weak and that he's crumbling. In other words, it was just an argument of logic. That didn't make any sense at all. The second parable is actually an allegory. Because it's got characters. And it's, real, it's really fun to identify who the characters are. Because this is the essence of the gospel. Of what Jesus came to do. Look at the next verse. Verse 27. But no one can enter a strong man's house. And plunder his goods. Unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. So what is that about? Well it's a story about a strong man. Who has some stuff in his house. And all of a sudden one day a stronger man shows up and binds him. Wraps him up. Ties him up. And takes his stuff. That is an allegory of our story. That's exactly what happened to us. Okay, so who's the strong man in this story? The strong man is Satan. Okay, what's his house? This earth. So what's his stuff? We're his stuff. You see, the Bible says we were born in sin, and it says we're in the dominion of darkness, and we are bound by that. Our eyes have been closed by the God of this world until the day Jesus opens our eyes and sets us free. He delivers us from a domain of darkness to the domain of light. So guess what? In the story, the strong man has control. He's got us in his house. And then one day, the stronger man shows up. Who is the stronger man? Jesus. So the night that a baby cried in Bethlehem, I believe the demons and Satan knew the stronger man had come. And he had come to bind up the strong man, Satan, to set free his possessions and to claim them for his own. So for me today, I am so thankful that I serve the stronger man and he set me free. And I don't serve the strong man anymore. No more. I've been changed by that. So Jesus said, how could I cast out demons unless I'm the stronger man? man. Now, it was at this point, he gives one of, the, one of the toughest warnings in the entire Bible. 
And this has been so misunderstood. So I want you to watch carefully. I want you to read carefully. Let's start in verse 28. Truly I say to you, if you have a King James, it will say verily, verily I say unto you, or verily, verily I say unto you. This is the name or word, amen. You know, when we say amen, we, sometimes we mean different things. In the scripture, when amen occurs, that is basically saying, you need to listen to this. This is the truth. All right, so he says, truly. Now, I grew up King James and heard barely, barely. And I used to always think, man, if, if my mom ever looks at me and goes, verily, verily, I'm in deep trouble. Because it, it's something bad is coming. Well, in this case, it's not something bad. It's just something very important. This is the first time Jesus has actually used that in Mark's gospel. He'll use it 12 other times, but this is the first one. And what he says is, truly, I say unto you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man. And whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Oh my. A sin for which you can never be forgiven. And there's only one. It's called blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Now, the word blasphemy just means to speak against, stand against, reject, uh, fight against. I mean, there's a lot of ways you can translate it, but it basically means that. It is very interesting that Holy Spirit is used, not the Spirit, because it's the first time Holy Spirit has occurred in this gospel. It was as if Jesus was pointing to the future of what the role of the Holy Spirit was. Now, hear what he said. Other blasphemies will be forgiven but not this one. So what is it about this one that makes forgiveness impossible? Okay, the Holy Spirit was sent to this earth for one reason, to be the abiding presence of Jesus in our life, to draw us to Christ, to convict us of sin. In fact, none of us in this room could have ever become believers without the Holy Spirit drawing us. And so because the Holy Spirit is the person of Christ through whom God draws us to himself, when you say no to him, when you reject or resist the Holy Spirit, there's no possible salvation and forgiveness. Why? Because that is the person that invites you to come to forgiveness and to receive grace. And so I want to show you, if, if, if I could just kind of act this out, if that's the medicine, okay, and I'm the Holy Spirit, I am reaching out to every one of you to come to this. If you look at me and say, no, thank you, you're not getting to that. I am the means by which God is drawing you to this. So when you reject the Holy Spirit, you're saying no to the one who is all about bringing us to faith. We couldn't even come apart from him. The second thing, it's the Holy Spirit that convicts you. You need the medicine. In other words, without the Holy Spirit, you're, you're doing fine. No, I don't need that. I'm good. I'm all good. You would never feel a thing if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit in your life. He is the one who convicts of sin. He's the one that makes you realize, I need Jesus. So if you say no to him, there is no forgiveness. Every other blasphemy will be forgiven, but the one against the very means by which God forgives us will never be forgiven. I, I think Holy Spirit is like pain in our body. When you have a pain somewhere, like if your side really starts hurting, you're going to start trying to figure out what's going on, and you'll end up at a doctor's office, and they're going to try to figure out what's causing the pain. The pain is an alarm it, it's something you need to pay attention to, okay? The Holy Spirit's role is like that. The Holy Spirit is to show you your need, convict you of your need, and to bring you into that forgiveness of Jesus. But if you say no to the pain, whatever it is will kill you. I don't, I don't have any feeling or very little about mid-calf down. 
because I have neuropathy. It's idiopathic. They don't know what calls it, or either I'm an idiot. I'm not sure what idiopathic means, but um, they don't know what it is. So from about here down, I don't feel anything. And yesterday, I was with my daughter, Hannah, and her boyfriend, Chris Blackwell, and we were out trying to get to this little pond to, to go fishing it because it's grown up and it was thick. And so we were trying to get there before the owner came out. And no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> do you think I would actually go fish somewhere just to catch a big fish? No, I would never do that, would I? Uh, so anyway, we're, we're, we're kind of stomping through the brush and everything. And we ended up not even being able to fish because it was so thick. Anyway, we get back and sit down and start to drive out. And I look down, I got blood going everywhere. I'm like, what in the world? Who's bleeding? And I realized it's me. I never felt the thing. So then I obviously cleaned it up and tried to, you know, do what I needed to do. But I never felt the thing. You know what worries me most about this sin? You never feel a thing. You don't feel anything. You don't want the medicine because you don't need the medicine. And what you're doing is you're dying and you don't even realize it. So let me give you three words to help you remember this sin. Number one, it's willful. You choose to commit this sin. If you're sitting here today or you're listening to my voice and you think, I'm, I'm afraid I've committed it, if, if you're worried about it, you haven't. You know why you'd be worried about it? The Holy Spirit. That's where that feeling comes from. That's where the conviction comes from. So if you're worried about having committed the unforgivable sin, you're not. You haven't. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. The second thing, it's man's refusal, not God's. I get this question a lot. Is there a time ever in my life where God will not hear my prayer and save me? My answer is no. There is never a time when God will say no to you or spurn your, your confession and your repentance. Never. The Scripture never indicates there is a moment at which you come in confession and repentance and He says no. So is it possible that if you commit this sin, there's still a chance later you could come back to Jesus? Absolutely. There were those there that day that ended up believing in him. His family ended up believing in him. My goodness, James, his half-brother, wrote the book of James in the New Testament. An amazing servant. So see, I think it's man's refusal, not God's. It's not like God saying, okay, I'm mad at you and I'm never going to hear your... No. It's you saying no. But here's the warning. The more you say no, the harder it is to say yes. The more you reject the Spirit moving and drawing and the conviction, the harder it is to overcome it and believe. It's kind of like a callus. You got a callus on your hand. You know, if you work with your hands and you start developing calluses, what is that? That's just kind of the skin's way of protecting your skin, and you don't feel anything on that callus. It numbs it. What happens to your heart is you develop a callus. You don't feel him anymore. I think it's the most dangerous place to be in life is when you no longer feel convicted about anything. When you're in the presence of God and his people and there's worship or something happening or a story about Jesus and you don't feel anything, that's not a good place to be. You see, I want to feel pain because pain lets me know something's wrong. I need the Holy Spirit to convict. So to reject that Holy Spirit is our refusal to even listen. And the more you do it, the harder it is to hear the Holy Spirit later. And then the last thing, it's a sin against the Spirit. There are three of them in the New Testament. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is one. The only unforgivable sin. Let me make sure you hear this. Adultery is not the only unforgivable sin. You may get killed, but you can be forgiven. Okay? Divorce. Please hear me. Not the unforgivable sin. Name whatever sin you want. Not the unforgivable sin. There is only one and it is the refusal to receive the Holy Spirit because he is the means by which God draws you to forgiveness. The other two sins, quenching the Holy Spirit and grieving the Holy Spirit. Those are three sins mentioned specifically against the Holy Spirit. The grieving is just when you do something that breaks the heart of God. 
I mean, just like you would cause somebody to grieve, you cause him to grieve. The quenching is when you kind of put a lid on it and you won't really let the Spirit of God do what he wants to do and you resist it. That's quenching. So let me just say this. I don't believe a believer, a follower of Jesus, can commit the unforgivable sin. And the reason is, is because you have already received Jesus. I believe you can get real close. And that's quenching. And there are consequences. I believe quenching and grieving are what believers do that break God's heart. So remember, this is a sin for those who will not even give him a chance. Now, what does he do from that? He turns the tables and he goes back to his family. Verse 31, and his mother and his brothers came and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him. And they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. That is a phenomenal thing. Mark basically starts with the family. He ends with the family. And he says, As they're gathered at that house, somebody sends word to Jesus, your family's out here, and Jesus looks around the room, and he says, no, who are my family? No, my family are those who do the will of my Father, those who believe. You know why that was so big? In that day, lineage, bloodline meant everything. That's why the genealogy of Jesus is in Matthew and Luke, and it was so important. Why? Bloodline. Who's your family? Well, if you came from a significant family, then you're significant. It was all about bloodline. And here's what Jesus says. I don't care where you came from because obedience is thicker than blood. Obedience is thicker than blood. Belief is thicker than blood. You know what makes you a part of the family of God? It's not that your parents were Christians. It's not that my daddy was a pastor. What makes me a part of the family of God is that one day I put my belief in Jesus Christ. And I said, Jesus, I believe you're Lord. That's what makes us a part of the family of God. And so today, in this moment, here's the question. Do you believe? Now, as you think about it, C.S. Lewis said there are only three options. C.S. Lewis was the agnostic in England that really was a challenge to Christianity, but in the process, God turned his heart, became one of the greatest writers, and very philosophical, a brilliant man. Here's what he concluded. There are only three choices about belief in Jesus. Only three. Number one, you have to believe Jesus was a lunatic. That's what his family did. It's exactly what his family did. Number two, or you can choose to believe he was a liar. That's what the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the the scribes did. They thought he was lying about the kingdom of God. He was really from Satan. Or, C.S. Lewis says, he is Lord. And he said, you cannot pick a fourth option and say, well, I don't believe he's a liar. I don't believe he's a lunatic, but I'm, I'm, I'm not there at the point of Lord yet. He says, no, no, no. You're, you're there. You've already made your decision. There's only three choices. He's either liar, lunatic, or he's the Lord. Now, as for me, I know without a doubt today, I can stand here in front of you and tell you, I believe Jesus Christ is Lord. And there's not a doubt in my mind about it. I don't understand A lot of stuff about him I don't understand. But I I do know this. He is who he said he was. He is the Lord. So I'm going to invite you today. If you've never been able to declare your belief in Jesus, here's a great opportunity. We're going to read a passage out of Philippians that is a confession. It is a confession. We're going to read it. And in it, it basically says that you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, what else this says is that those in heaven believe, those on earth will believe, and all those under the earth. This verse basically tells me that one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
And we have this day and we have this moment. So I want to ask you, is Jesus Christ Lord? And if your declaration is yes, I want you to read this with me. We're going to read it loud. And then we're going to sing immediately, oh, praise the name. Because it basically says in that song, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, our God. Let's stand together. I want you to read this with me. And as you're affirming your faith, if you're affirming that you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, you especially, I want you to say it loud. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore, for endless days. We will sing of praise, oh Lord, oh Lord our God. Come on, sing. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore, for endless days. We will sing our praise, oh Lord, oh Lord our God. Sing it up. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore, for endless days. We will sing our praise, oh Lord, oh Lord our God. Give Him praise. He is the Lord. So if you just sang, for the first time, you just declared, Jesus, I believe. All I want to say to you is welcome to God's family. Welcome to the family of Jesus. Followers of Christ, not who have it all figured out, but who have enough figured out to know that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is not a lunatic. He's not a liar. He is the Lord. Today, if that's something that you've wanted to, to declare and take that step, maybe you sang the song, maybe you didn't. It doesn't matter. We want to talk to you. We'd love to have a Jesus conversation about your faith. We've got a response room. It's right over there to the right, your left. And we've got people that will be there to pray with you, to talk with you, and just to encourage you. Maybe you're already a follower of Christ. You've already made that declaration. But there's other areas you feel like the Spirit of God is being quenched or maybe grieved, we'll be, we'll be there to pray with you. We're on this journey together. We're learning about him together and passionately pursuing him. This has changed our life. God's remedy has changed everything. And please, don't walk out of here today thinking, well, I, there's a sin, there's a sin I've committed that's going to send me to hell. The only thing that sends you to hell is to say no to the remedy that God has offered in his son Jesus. And we want to help you say yes. In fact, if there are folks in this room that have not said yes, we have posted guards at the door. You will not be able to leave the crowd. <laughs> Just kidding. I would love to do that. But faith is a personal matter, and it's a decision you make. And so I pray you will make it. But as you consider it, we're going to declare again before we walk out that Jesus is Lord. Remember? After the service, after we, they sing us out, if you want to hang around for a little bit, then we're going to welcome our brothers and sisters, and they're going to come and just let us enjoy a little bit of how God is working in their life. Church, here's what I want you to do. Before we walk out, before we conclude this service, I want you to say with me, the one thing I know, there's a lot I don't know about the Bible, about faith, about Jesus. But the one thing I know is that Jesus is is Lord. Can you say it with me? Jesus is Lord. One more time. Jesus is Lord. 
God bless you. Have a wonderful Lord's Day. Oh, praise the name of the Lord.